product manager, we have participation from 46 African countries, and then um, one person from the United States and another from the UK, and then one person from Ukraine, actually two people from Ukraine. So we welcome all of you guys. Now, we'll be going into the presentation pretty shortly. Then when we are done with the presentation, we can open up and invite for a Q&A session where we can interact and then we can be done. So financial immunity is one of the programs that the Financial Literacy Foundation is spearheading. And the Financial Literacy Foundation is basically an organization that is looking at reaching out to every African in the sub of the Sahara to make sure that financial independence is a reality so that every young African, everybody who calls himself an African, wherever they may be in the world, will be given the right knowledge, the right guidance, the right um, understanding so that he, he or she can be literate financially in order to make the right money decisions with a very good and high level of understanding so that by 2030, eight out of every 10 Africans can be signed off as financially independent through financial literacy. So this is one of the programs that the Financial Literacy Foundation um, for Africa runs across the continent. And it is in partnership with one of the projects they call FLICA or FLEPA. FLICA is basically a um, financial literacy for coronavirus poverty alleviation. And we are looking forward to making sure that the consequences of the pandemic on people's finances are um, eradicated or alleviated so that we are able to overcome and build strong immunity. My presentation is going to go through this outline. I'll be looking at what I call the preamble musings. I'll look at the COVID-19 Sub-Saharan African economic downturn. I'll look at financial immunity and the rule of thumb. And then I'll go into what exactly the financial services universe is about. Because when we talk about financial immunity, it is connected to a world of financial services. And my, my job at this time will be to make sure that everybody who is joined us appreciates that universe. So you would be well informed to now move up to using 12 critical keys I'll be sharing to building immunity against any financial difficulty. Now, this is my preamble musings. If you can look at this slide, I have titled it Against the Odds, Against the Odds. And this is an OECD statistic that talks about income mobility across generations. So basically it is looking at the number of generations it will take for those who are born in low income families to move up and approach the mean income in their society. So this is a global survey to check how easy it is for somebody who is born in a low income family to move up the ladder of earning high incomes or getting into the bracket of high income or even middle income. And when you look at this statistic, which is a global statistic, you will barely find any African country sitting in this statistic. And that is just a preamble musing for you to know that particularly for those who find themselves in the continent of Africa or on the continent of Africa, most importantly, the sub-Saharan part, I really find not even more than two. And the only one we find in this data is South Africa. And even for South Africa, it will take nine generations to work so hard yourself out if you are born into a low-income family. 
So that, that is just amusing for you to know that the, the, the conversation around financial immunity is a very critical conversation, particularly for those of us who are on the continent of Africa. There are other developing continents that have similar challenges, but the statistics show that you would probably need to put in a little bit more Have to do and do it very well and better now. The next thing I'll take you to once again is what I call the consequential effect of this statistic on the entire sub Saharan African continent. And um, I am giving a signal that I will need to share the slide again. So let me. Let me, let me share it again. I think we just lost out on the slide. So let me share the slide again so that you can also see what I'm, I'm talking about. But ultimately, if you look at the preamble, which is titled Against the Odds, and you now take another look at the statistic that talks about the severe economic downturn expected in the sub-Saharan African continent. You will notice that then there is a lot we have to do, particularly on the continent. And immediately on top of the data, you will notice that in sub-Saharan Africa, the projections of real GDP growth have been thrown over the walls. And the projections that were averaging 3.5 up to about six are now all down to negative. So countries in the sub of the Sahara who were making projections above 3% are now looking at negative um, growth rates. Now I deliberately break them down into countries that are oil exporters, countries that um, handle other, resource in, 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 um, other resources that they export apart from oil, and then non-resource intensive countries. So they are resource intensive countries, that is those who depend um, on resources to build their GDP and the economy, and those that do not. And then those that depend on oil exportation, and those that depend on tourism, and then those that depend on what we call the frontier markets. When you look at all that still, the COVID situation is making the cases of financial independence a very difficult conversation to have. And my slide is making it very much simple. So let me pause here and go back to sharing the slide so that you guys can see as well, because I'm told again that it's gone off once again. Right. So let me share once again. Great. All right, so I think we are back.
So I initially shared with you the initial preamble that talks about against the odds. And I was saying that this data shows that it will be extremely difficult to move from a low income, um, a low income family to a high income family, especially when you're on the continent of Africa. Because if you look at the data, the top five are Denmark, Finland, Norway, Sweden, and Australia. You come all the way to Ireland, Korea, Portugal, Italy, United States, Austria, and the only African country you see is South Africa. So it should tell you how difficult it will be. Then I did a simulation and said that in addition to that, the coronavirus pandemic has even made our challenges even more a bit quite disruptive. And so if you look at the data here, the data here is also showing that countries in the sub-Saharan African region that were projecting a positive GDP growth, which I mean, GDP basically talking about the economic might of these countries are now all looking downwards and negative. So if you look at the data, you see that below the middle belt line, all the numbers are turning negative. And so all the countries sub of the Sahara that depend on exportation of oil, that depend on um, um, tourism, that depend on what we call resource intensive um, 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 production are all now looking at a negative growth. And I mean, for the example in Ghana, we are, we are moving from a projected growth rate of about 6.7 to now minus one or something like that. Um, they are projecting 0 0.9, but I'm projecting, we at FLF Africa are projecting a negative one point, maybe five or something like that. So it is, Something that shows that, especially in these COVID times, if you are watching and you are looking to build immunity financially, then you've got a big task on your hand. You've got a huge task on your hand. Now look at it again. I look at North Africa, West Africa, Central Africa, Eastern, Southern, and then the entire continent. And you can see that the comparatives in terms of what COVID is doing to our GDP is so amazing between four to eight percent drop of our GDPs. Between four to eight percent drop of our GDPs. And that is not good news for any person on that part of the continent. So on the left side, again, look at this slide. You will see the previous growth forecasts. And when you see green, green is a positive growth forecast. Then when you see gold, gold is the flat growth forecast. And then when you see it entering into red, it is the negative growth forecast. Before the COVID, the one on the left was a picture of the economic growth across the sub-Saharan African region. So you will see a number of green spotlights. Then fast forward, beginning April, when the continent began experiencing the consequences of COVID-19, you notice that now the green outlook, which meant positive outlook, is now turning into almost every one of them being either gold, which is flat, or red, which is negative. Again, it should also be um, a pointer for you. So with these two specific indicators, background information and pointers, if you are watching now, my question for you is, are you financially immune to the picture the COVID-19 situation is throwing on the financial minds of the continent of Africa? Are you immune? And this is how I'm going to be um, checking that. In this slide, we have what we call the financial immunity calculator that we'll share with all of you participants that have joined right after particularly those on the, um, on, with us on Zoom. And when you fill that calculator, it will throw back to you your, your immunity. Because when we say immunity, just like in, um, in health, you will see that you are able to build a resistance against um, sickness or disease. In the same way, when we talk about financial immunity, we are looking at your ability to build resistance, your ability to fight um, 
a downturn in terms of your financial health. And so when we say, are you financially immune? One of the critical indicators we use according to the rule of thumb is for example, assuming you are to lose your source, your major source of income tomorrow or today, how long are you able to survive on your own self without the income that you earlier on depended on? How long are you able to depend on your own income without having to resort to a third party or a loan or anybody else for help? If you are able to do that for minimum of six months, then your immunity system financially is broken down. So it, it, is, it is a question you probably have to answer and it will give you an idea that if your major source of income, your job or your business should go negative, go southward, go red, go bust right now, are you able to survive on your mobilized income or on your existing income without having to resort to any help from anywhere for the next six months? If it is yes, then your financial immunity is a bit healthy because for some, it could either go for even more than, more than, more than a year, two years, three years. In fact, if it can go for three years and above, then your immunity is superb. It's in the A++. But if it cannot do minimum six months, then you are financially bankrupt. And that becomes a danger. And we'll give the calculator after this also to become a, a guy. Now, so if your answer was yes or no, we are going to now begin a navigation to now show how we can help you to build financial immunity, COVID or no COVID. How do you build financial immunity going forward? Particularly for those of us who are on the continent, I know some people have joined us from the States and from, from the, the, the United Kingdom, but my concentration for financial literacy Africa, my concentration is particularly on working families on the continent, particularly south of the Sahara. And I'm saying that one critical key that will help anybody watching us or listening to us will be the key of understanding the financial services universe. Now, when we say the financial services universe, it is the world of financial services that has an implication on your financial well-being. The world of financial services that has a direct implication on your financial well-being. And it is one of the critical determinants of your financial immunity or otherwise. Now, for the purposes of financial immunity class 2.1, we are going to look at the critical anchors. One is banking, two is pensions, three is insurance, and four is investments. So in the financial services universe, if you want to really build immunity, then you have to appreciate the workings of these four pillars in this universe so that you can make them work to your advantage. Now, when we say banking, banking is simply um, a matter of credit and deposits. So in the banking system, what happens is that the banking system becomes an intermediary institution that gathers or receives deposits of people who have enough to spare. And then they find a way to intermediate to now give the same funds to others who don't have at all. So the banking system all the way from the tier one bank all the way up to the high street bank. So the tier one bank can be community banks, the credit union, the savings and loans, um, the microcredit institutions, all the way up to the universal banks. Basically, all they do is that they mobilize deposits and then they give credit out to others. And the price of the credit is what is shared for those who did the deposit. So basically banking for you in the financial services universe helps you for business transaction and also helps you with deposit mobilization. So for you, you leverage on the banking system just to one, build deposits and two, if you want to leverage on the credit system. But as I go along, you will notice that 
it is only good to leverage on one part of this banking system and not the other part. Other than that, you, you end up becoming financially um, um, challenged. The next thing block under the financial services universe that you have to understand is the pensions block. Now, in the pensions block, we are basically looking at how you build the finances of your future in terms of retirement because there will definitely be a day that you may not be able to go to work the way you are going to work now and in the loss of 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 retirement planning there is always a particular age where you are not allowed to work actively again so the financial services world has the pensions unit or pensions block that is able to mobilize savings and deposits in the present and then make that deposit available to now pay for people when they now are no more in active work or in service. So that when they now are not um, expected to be earning regular income, the deposit and the savings they made for their retirement cannot take care of them until a time when they will... Um, they would leave the universe. And so for you, the way you must let this system also work for you is that you have to appreciate the financial system and its regulations that borders in your country so that you can now take advantage of the pension system. Now, universally, the pension system only takes money from you. And most of the time it is mandatory. And there are level of tiers. They are tier one, tier two, tier three, and in other, other places, they are even tier four. Usually, the initial big sum tier is mandatory by law. And it is a deduction that happens every single month when you receive your income, with or without your notice. And it goes to a, a governing body, a regulating body, a managing body, or an administrator that makes sure that they manage that contribution so that by the time you retire, you are able to receive regular income until you die. Then the second and third or so tiers, they also have some level of compulsion and voluntary options. So the first one becomes the main system. And usually it is public service. It is driven by government, controlled by government. The second one is driven by the, the private sector. And in some jurisdictions, it's mandatory. So that you have one level of protection, another second level of protection, and then the third level becomes voluntary. So you would have to understand the pensions regime in your, in your, in your jurisdiction so that you can leverage on the mandatory ones and even the voluntary ones and make sure you leverage them to your advantage by the time you retire. Now, there is a mindset you need to have if you want them to benefit you. The mindset you need to have is that you shouldn't see retirement as something that is going to happen to you at a particular age. You shouldn't see retirement as something that will happen to you when you don't have any option of not working. So your understanding of retirement and your planning towards retirement should begin from the very day you begin earning your first paycheck. So if you want to leverage the banking and the pension system, then I'm saying that on the pension side, begin to think about retirement the very first day you receive your first salary. Why? Because retirement is when you work because you want to, not when you work because you have to. If you don't build this system for yourself, you can reach the mandatory age where you don't have to continue working again, but you will not have enough money to take care of yourself. Remember, in pension, your income reduces, your expenses increase. Why? Because there are a number of expenses that you don't have control over and they are constant even in retirement. And so you notice that in retirement, your health bills will not go on, on retirement. In retirement, your accommodation bills will not go on retirement. In retirement, your utility bills will not go on retirement. However, your incomes, regular incomes will go on retirement. Now, remember that today that you are working and earning 100% of your incomes, it is not enough for you to take care of yourself. So can you imagine when you retire and you are now taking just a fraction, most of the time, not about 
sometimes even five or less. And you are now going to depend on this income 100% to even pay for so many bills and pay for so many commitments in addition to using it for your regular expenses. So you notice that particularly in Africa, many people approach their death quite faster after retirement. Why? Because they even become more poorer and they're unable to take care of themselves. And so for you to leverage and build immunity, you must begin to think about retirement this way, that you would want to retire when you work because you want to, not when you work because you have to. Because when you work because you want to, you can even be at 45 and you will stop regular work from going to the office from, say, 8 a.m. to maybe 5 p.m. You decide when you go. And if you retire that early, you would have planned and you retire that early, you don't just get up to work because you have to, because you can take care of yourself. But if you don't leverage on this, then even in your retirement, you probably have to change your date of birth, probably have to change your birth certificate, or to take on contracts, even though you may be on retirement, to still work at that very old age. And there are a number of people. In fact, statistics in parts of Africa show that when you pick every 100 people who are working, who retire at age 60, only two, only two, only two go on retirement and they become financially independent. 73%, they would have to depend on the first, uh, first retirement income savings that they did to, to, to the government service that manage their pension. And most of the time, it is close to nothing, zero. It pays almost nothing. So many people die and they are challenged. So your mindset about pension should not be something that is 20 years to come, 30 years to come. No, your mindset about pension is, I want to retire, meaning I'm not waiting to become old, but there's a time where I will not have to wake up and go to work from, say, 8 a.m. to 5 p.m., but I'll work at my own pace. I will work because of purpose. I will work because of passion. I will not work because I, I, I need income to survive, but income becomes an extra. And if you approach your pension in the, the pension pillar with this mindset, you will, you will leverage it to your advantage and you become financially immune. The next pillar you've got to understand is the pillar of insurance. Again, if you want to make sure you have built immunity, you have to understand this also because that is how the financial services universe works together. Now, insurance is just a safeguard against risk in simple terms. Insurance is not a guarantee for a return. So universally, there is life assurance and there is general insurance. And the general covers a number of things, social health, among other things. So you, there is health insurance, there is social insurance, there is um, fire insurance, a number of things. But you group them ultimately into general and then life. Now, many people do not understand what insurance is about. And I'm going to use a good example for you to understand it literally. If I pick your motor insurance as an example, you will notice that motor insurance come in the form of either comprehensive insurance or um, a third party insurance. Now, when you go to the insurer and you say you want to buy insurance for your car, the moment you part away money to get an insurance product for your car, there is no guarantee that if your car does not run the risk of an accident, you are going to be paid anything. There may be cashbacks and payback policies, premiums and things. But ultimately, insurance does not give you a guaranteed return. It rather gives you protection against risk. And so when you are thinking about building financial immunity, many people buy insurance products. And when you ask them if they have any investment for themselves, their first explanation is that, yes, I have an insurance policy and I pay a premium. But your premium is not like an investment. Your premium is not like the deposit you put in the bank. Your premium is not like the retirement savings you made at the pension office. No, your premium is money you are parting away so that just in case you run into trouble, the insurance company can meet you halfway to overturn the consequences of the risk you envisage. 
And so if your whole financial life is about one in insurance policy you have, and that is all, and you are not leveraging on the banking side, you are not leveraging on the pension side, you are really exposing yourself to a big mess in terms of financial immunity. Having said that, it is still important to leverage on the benefit of the protection of risk for your life, for your house, for your properties, for anything else on the insurance side. Just that, do not exchange the understanding of insurance to mean a consistent deposit instrument or a consistent retirement savings or a consistent investment account. It is not. Then the last pillar in the financial services universe that you've got to understand for your immunity building is the pillar of asset management or investments. Now, this is one critical area that many people also do not understand. When we say investments, many people immediately think about <laughs> the possibility of losing their money. Unfortunately, it is so because across the continent, there have been many crises in the financial services universe where many people did not even investigate if the supposed investment houses had um, licenses or they had the right set of uh, teams and things like that to be able to um, promise longevity. Now, because that did not happen, this is the problem you have as I speak today. The problem you have is that many people do not appreciate the role of investment because I've talked about banking, I've talked about pension, I've talked about insurance, but among these four pillars, the most critical indicator that can help you very well to get whatever you need in terms of financial immunity is investment. Why is it investment? Because it is only in investment that your money goes to work for you in addition to you working for money. And so you have to understand investment very clearly. And to understand investment very clearly, you've got to understand maximum two main things. The capital markets, the money markets. So in the investment world, there is a capital market and then there is a money market. The capital market look at any money you pass away that is aimed at growing your income over a long term. And here long term will mean any period about five years. The money market is the same purpose, but the duration is a year or less. So anytime you are going to put money into an investment instrument, have these two things at the back of your mind. Now, when you understand these two universe, then the next thing you have to appreciate is this. In investment, the greater the return you are promised, the greater the risk associated with that return. Just like anything in life just like anything in life. The greater the return, the greater the, 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 the risk. So what you have to do is to appreciate the risk involved in each of the, 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 the options you are taking so that you will find a way to take advantage of that risk and not become a victim of that risk. And one of the critical things you have to always look at is that before you take an investment decision, you have to decide and be clear on your mind what the objectives are. So if, for example, I want to put money away and take it in 91 days, which is three months, I don't go and buy a share. A share is a long-term product or an equity. And that share promises dividends. It promises capital gains. And it promises capital loss. But usually they don't say it. So every share you buy promises dividends, which is the return the company will make. So first, a share is a portion you own in any company. If it is listed on the regulated shares market, which we call the stock exchange, then it will pay you um, dividends based on the dividend policy. So if the company makes returns, the portion they will give you based on the number of shares you have is called dividend. So any share you buy can give you dividend if they make profits based on their dividend policy. It will also give you capital gain. Capital gain means that there is always a price you bought your share. If the market works like that, the price you bought it is now below the present price on the market, 
So I bought it at $1, but as at the close of the market yesterday, maybe it is $5. The difference between your $1 purchase price and the existing $5 price today on the market, that becomes what we call the capital gain. However, you make that capital gain when you activate a sale. So the capital gain doesn't just come to you, but if you decide to sell, then the capital gain will come to you and then you make the difference which you call the capital gain. However, the inverse is true. There can be a time where you bought it at $1. The next moment you went to check, it is below $1. That's why we call it capital loss. And so before you make a purchase in shares or even go into the investment well, you have to appreciate all these things among others that I will explain um, as I move on. But I'm saying that begin to, to know that for immunity for your finances, wherever you are on the continent, understand banking, understand pensions, understand insurance, and then understand investments. Having said that, if you look at the screen now, you will see what I think is a must know, particularly going into leveraging your immunity. So one of the critical things I want you to understand in building your financial immunity is to know the differences between savings and investments. Remember, savings will sit in the banking world. Investment will sit in the investment world or the asset management world. They are not the same. When you save in a bank account, either in a current or a savings account, and again, a current account is transactional. So it only charges you, it doesn't pay you anything. So if all your account is current, it means you are working for the institution. Unless the transaction you are using that account for pays you over and above what you are paying to the bank for, then it makes sense. But if you are not working, you are not doing much and all, all you have, the little you have from the little job you are doing is in a current account, you are shortchanging yourself because you are rather paying more to the bank than you are earning. You are not earning it on a current account. So again, in the bank, you always tilt towards savings account because savings account, not much though, but it will pay you something that is that is um, going to compensate for the charges that a regular account are giving you. So I'm choosing savings, not current account or transactional account. And I'm saying that just having a savings account is not the same as having an investment account. So if you have been saving for the last 30 years, it is not the same if you had been investing for the last 30 years. If you can take your mind back to the first time you open a bank account and it is more than five years and you have never opened an investment account over the same period, you have not done yourself any good in terms of financial immunity. Why? Why? I'm going to explain it. Look at this slide. Savings only keep your money safe. S-A-F-E, safe from fire, safe from theft, safe from flood, safe from losing it, or safe from even just spending it anyhow. That is where it ends. If you want immunity, move beyond savings and let your money also now work for you and generate an income source. So if you look at the slide now, as I speak now, you will see two different tables. And forget about the currency. It can be any country. So those of us, those of us who are not using the CD, forget about the, the currency. But you can put your currency there. But the numbers are true. Let's take the first box. Look at it carefully. You have to understand this. It is one of the critical things, you, if you understand, will give you financial immunity. You will see years to retirement. It means the duration you want to give yourself. You will see 100K, so 100,000 in any currency. You will see 250K in any currency. You will see 500K in any currency, up to a million. Now, on the right side of that same bus, you will see minimum amount to save monthly. So on the left side, I am analyzing somebody who decides to just save. 
but it's aiming at getting 100,000, 250,000, 500,000, 750,000, or a million in any currency. Now, if the person wants to achieve 100,000, let's start with 100,000. If the person wants to achieve 100,000 savings in 30 years, or in 25 years, or in 20 years, or in 15 years, or in 10 years, the amount under the 100K is the amount they will need to put aside every single month for the period in question. So if somebody wants to achieve 100,000 savings over 10 years, what it means is that averagely a savings account will be paying you 5% per annum. Could be less. But if it is 5%, which problem might be the biggest? For 10 years, you would have to put aside 647 whatever currency and do it for 10 years before you can achieve 100,000 in whatever currency. Look at that carefully. So I want to achieve 100,000. I want to keep, mobilize $100,000, 100,000 kwacha, 100,000 whatever, pounds. And I want to do that in 10 years. I'm saying that if you did it in a regular savings account, Every month for 10 years, you have to put aside 647 in order to achieve the 100K. If I wanted to do it in 15 years, because the duration is longer beyond 10 years, the contribution amount will go down. So it will move from 647 to 377, if you can see that carefully. Here, the left. So 15 years, you will see that 15 years, you will need to do 377. 10 years, you will need to do 647. The more the years become longer, so from 10 to 30 years, you notice that the monthly contribution reduces. What is this telling you? This is saying that the longer, the longer the time you have to build your financial immunity, the less stressful it is in terms of the amount you put aside to achieve that goal. So any young person listening to me who has a minimum of 25 years, 30 years to go on retirement can become a millionaire before they retire, if they are interested. But anybody who has just 10 years to go can also be just that he will need to be stretching himself in terms of the monthly contribution. Now, with this example under savings, let's keep the same scenario under investing and let's see who would achieve this goal faster. So come to the right side and look at the same diagram. But this time, we are putting it in an investment instrument that is paying an average of 15% per annum. The same, the same 10 years, if I want to achieve 100,000 in whatever currency, and I am rather investing it and not putting it in a savings account, you will notice that instead of putting down 647 in a savings account, I will put down almost half for investment, why? Because investment will pay the difference in returns. Now, if I even want to now give myself more time, what will cost me 122 CDs for every month to achieve 100,000 in 30 years? It will cost me just 17 in whatever currency. So in whatever currency you have, every month, 17 CDs, every month, every month, 17 in that currency, and you would achieve that goal Instead of putting aside 122, you will do 17. What does that tell you? It tells you that investment is the quickest vehicle that can give you financial immunity. So ultimately, understand banking, leverage it. Understand pensions, leverage it. Understand insurance, leverage it. But ultimately, your critical key under the financial services universe to build a solid immunity against any challenge against any downturn, against any unforeseen circumstance, just like the COVID situation has done across the continent, it's investment. And all throughout across the continent, you notice that we are almost the most hit in our continent. Why? Because we have not leveraged on the power of investing under the financial services universe. And the countries that did have been able to master a better immunity, even though everybody has been hit. And that is a consequential effect on every individual. So going forward, my friends, you have to get on your marks and pick these 12 critical keys and begin to open the key of investing where your money works for you.
you open the key of banking where you leverage on savings. You open the key of pensions where you leverage on making sure that you are looking at retirement in terms of not just retiring at a particular age, but you are looking at retirement in terms of a time where you don't have to work because you have to, but you work because you want to. Because for many people, if they had it in their power not to go to work tomorrow morning, for example, they would have not gone. But it is not in the it is not it is not it is not for them to say you don't have an option. When it is Monday morning, you get before Monday morning, you are you are trouble. It is Monday again. I'm going to start a struggle again, particularly in Africa. And we are thinking you are not happy, but you have to go because the moment you stop showing up, your income levels go down. It ceases, and you cannot survive when you don't have any income for the next six months. So you are not immune. You are exposed to a lot of threat financially. And you can't do anything for yourself. So you become a wage slave. You show up, you get paid. You show up, you get paid. You don't show up, you don't get paid. And you don't survive. And your dreams, your, your everything is messed up. That is why you have to take this conversation a little bit more serious. So what must you do? Number one, make financial independence your goal. All across the continent, if you are watching us, Make financial independence your goal. Because when you are financial independent, you are solid. You are well off. You are better to do. You are even healthier. You are healthier. Somebody said that the, the best immunity for COVID-19 is a bank deposit alert. If you just got an alert of $100,000, you see that your COVID-19 symptoms will vanish. So decide that I would be financially independent. I'll be able to take care of my children. On my child's wedding day, I should have enough to be able to write a check to buy a five-bedroom house for them as a wedding gift, and it doesn't hurt me. By age 50, I should decide not to work actively, but I work at my own pace, and still it doesn't hurt me. Make financial independence your goal. The continent of Africa must make financial independence our goal and strive and make sure that everybody, every child, by the time they are 18 years, they have whatever it takes financially to become what they want to become. If your parents did not do that for you, don't let your children be spared of that. Force and make financial independence your goal. Why? Because it's possible. The second critical key is to shift. Make a mental shift from consumption to investment. For many people, the moment money hits their account, the moment money hits their mobile phones, the moment money hits their alert systems, the first thing they think about is what am I going to buy? Why? Because the understanding of money is a medium of exchange for goods and services. That is what we have been taught in school. So anytime money hits your pocket, the next thing you think about is a new hairstyle. The next thing you think about is a new shoe. The next thing you think about is a new television screen. The next thing you think about is to visit the new restaurant. If that becomes your mentality, you will forever have exposure to financial immunity. So shift from consumption to investment. So anytime any money hits your hands, anytime any money hits your account, make investment an expense item on your expense list as a budget. So that deliberately you say that I'm putting this money aside as an expense. And that becomes one of the expense items. So that you don't just think about putting money aside in investment after you have finished spending. It is when the money is finishing that you remember that I, I, I have not put any money aside. But rather, invest first as the first item or second, depending on who you are. If, if you're a Christian, you can, you can look at um, um, tight as a first, then you move to your investment as a second, before you even think about buying things, needs or wants. That is how you shift. That is how you shift. That is how you shift from consumption to investment. The young people on the continent are, are mortgaging their lives today for what they want to enjoy. 
And so every young person wants to have the latest item in town. They want to have the latest mobile phone in town. They want to sleep in the best um, accommodation. They want to drive the best car. They are not thinking about 20 years from now. They are not thinking about delaying gratification. They are always thinking about what can I spend today to please people who don't even bother about what I wear. Shifts from consumption to investment. So that if you have the next 10 years ahead of you and you take a decision to put aside $17 and you put it down, you put it down, you put it down to an investment instrument, you'll be amazed that by the time you are celebrating your 50th birthday, you are financially independent and you are immune to whatever is happening around you, either through politics or through your whatever challenge that your country may be facing. If you don't do that, you will be building another cycle of poverty for your children to come and continue. The third thing is to shift from aid to trade. Nobody is responsible for your financial independence. Nobody is responsible for what you become. You are responsible for your own financial independence. Why? Somebody saying, why should you say that? Because I don't earn much. If I don't earn much, how can I even think about what I'll put aside? Well, this mindset will make you the number one candidate for poverty. This is the mindset you should have. Any money that hits my hand, that is expendable. Any money that hits my hand, that I can use to buy something, it should be able to also have something I save from that money. It doesn't matter how much it is. If that money can buy something, then I can buy my future. I can pay my future bills also. So that you deny yourself and you shift from aid to trade, and you trade your ideas, you trade your, your, your products, you trade your solution, because then money becomes a reward for solving a problem, and not the, 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 the medium that serves as a legal tender for the exchange of goods and services. No. The fourth thing you've got to do as a key to building immunity is to count your pennies. Many people on the continent don't, don't, don't respect very small, 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 small amount of money. Every time money is little in your eyes, you think about spending it or consuming it frivolously. But begin to count your pennies. Because I showed you a table where a young person who decided to put aside $17 for over 30 years is able to raise $100,000, and that's the least. I have led many people who have put aside very small amount, a dollar today, a million tomorrow. So count your pennies. It doesn't matter how much it is. Count your pennies and leverage on the four different pillars I shared about in the financial services industry. The, the next item is to know your number one value enemy, particularly in Africa. Your number one value enemy is what I call inflation. Inflation is what eats away the value of the money that you are earning. And in Africa, inflation is always in double digits. So if you don't fight the number one enemy on the value of money you earn, you can be earning almost zero all the time because the moment you earn that value, inflation will reduce the value and you can't buy what you used to buy. So what do you do? You use investment to hit inflation. You don't use savings to hit inflation because savings rates usually are always less than inflation and, and, and the central government's, federal, federal government's uh, bill. So you buy investment that pays more than inflation and you are better off, you preserve your value in terms of the money you have and you're able to make more on it. The next thing, is to choose assets over liabilities. Choose assets over liabilities. Choose assets over liabilities. An asset is anything that will put money in your pocket when you spend money on it. A liability is anything that you rather will keep spending money on after you bought it or purchased it. So look around your house. Look around your room. Look around your environment. The things you spend on, begin to do an itinerary of the things you spend on. Are those things bringing you regular income or those things are taking money rather away from your income? If the number of things you, you, you've purchased with your own income only are able to take money away from you and they don't bring you anything, then I came to announce to you globally that you are a number one candidate for poverty and you don't have any immunity at all financially. You don't have much. 
But anytime there is a new release of a new phone, you want to buy some. Meanwhile, that phone is not meant to be used for business. That phone is just to be meant to be spending money on to buy data, to buy data to be browsing, to buy data to be what's happening, to buy credit to be calling. But I'm saying that if it is going to bring you more money, it's an asset. If it's just taking money away from you, it's a liability. You just bought the double-decker refrigerator. That double-decker refrigerator you just bought, is it going to be used to do a business that will bring you income every month or it becoming a decoration tool in your living bedroom? If it is just a decoration tool and it will just chill water and drinks for you to drink and you rather pay bills on it every month, you are a great candidate for poverty. Choose assets over liabilities. The next thing you have to do is to audit your waistline. And you can do that when you, you understand the difference between assets and liabilities. The next thing you have to do is to gather in summer. Gather in summer. Gather in summer. Gather in summer. Don't just spend when you have regular income. Many people never think about putting money aside when they have regular income. If you don't gather when you have regular income, the day you will not envisage a downturn, you'll be hot. That is why across the whole continent, there is not even one African country that did not go to IMF to take money. Not one. Why? Because we have not gathered in summer as a continent. We have not gathered. We cannot fall on any buffer. If this thing should continue the way it is for the next three years, every continent, every, every, every country on the continent, just about one or two will survive. And when it happens like that, you, the individual, will be affected because our economies are shrinking. And when we cannot go to the West or the East, for help, for loans, for debt instruments and things like that, and we have to depend on our own self, you will see that now poverty becomes even a bigger challenge, a bigger problem more than the COVID-19. Gather in summer. The next thing is to improve financial literacy. Be committed to understanding what makes you financially independent, like we are doing. Understand financial literacy. And here, I want to invite everybody who is watching us anywhere to spend time to go to our, 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 our webpage, financial literacy, flfafrica.org, and begin to educate yourself on what we are doing. We have launched a program across 46 countries on the continent, I think about 46, 48. And what we are doing is that by 2030, in eight out of every 10 Africans, we want to get everybody to appreciate what this whole financial uh, independence thing is about, to get everybody to appreciate what we are teaching so that people, whether they are schooled or they are in school, they will know what to do with their money. They will know how to make money. They will know how to manage money. They will know how to multiply money. The next thing is expand your income sources. Expand your income sources. Look, if your salary is your only source of income, you are in trouble. Your salary is supposed to be a source of income. It's supposed to be a source of income. It's not supposed to be your only source of income. Your salary is supposed to be one of the sources of your income. For anybody who wants to build financial immunity, you need a minimum of four sources of income. And it doesn't mean you have to go to work on all those of them physically. No, there are many ways you can generate multiple streams of income when you are even working from one office. And when you are working from one office, you are dedicating and everything, but there are other things you do that takes other people's time, that takes other people's effort, that takes other people's money with your talent, with your gifting, with your experiences, and they bring money, even with investment, even with investment. You will notice that when you earn money and you put the money to investment, at the end of the month, your regular salary will come and then the return on the investment will come. So then at least it gives you two sources of income. Build reserves with your other income sources. The last but one is neutralize the Parkinson's law. What is Parkinson's law? Parkinson's law is a financial law that says that incomes that increase are met at the same pace with expenses that will increase to match them. So you were earning $1,000, you were eating from some wayside um, restaurant. The moment your income goes to $2,000, you notice that you are invited by the increase in your income to now eat from a better restaurant. That will now bring up the expense to match the increased income. So you are at the same place. 
you were using Samsung Note 2 when you were earning 1,000. The moment your income went to 2,000, you notice that Samsung Note 2 doesn't have a very good feature. So then you have to buy Samsung Note 9. You have, you have neutralized the increase. The Parkinson's law has gotten up to you. And so you, you, your, your, your increased income has been cut off by your increased expenditure. So you are back to square one. If you want to build immunity, neutralize the Parkinson's law and its effect on your income. And ultimately, apply what I call supernatural laws. They are laws of wealth, but they are supernatural. You have to apply them. At another time, I'll explain some of them to you. But one of the critical laws that is supernatural is to learn to give, learn to give, learn to give unconditionally. You don't give when you have more. But if you can understand the supernatural law, the more you give, the more you get. The more you give, the more you get. Give to great projects. Give to things that matter to God. Give to poor people. Give to needy people. And you'll be amazed. That is a supernatural law. As I end on financial immunity, look at this dashboard. I invite everybody watching us to look at this dashboard. And I'm urging everyone watching practically to aspire to achieve a million whatever in any currency by age 60, if that is your retirement age. And if you look at the left side, the number of years it will take you, the right side, the amount you have to put, that, put down. And if you can do this over the period, $44, $89, $180, $44, CDs, $89, CDs, $84, CDs, $89, $84, $84, CDs, $84, kwacha, $89, kwacha, $180, kwacha. whatever currency it is, if you can do this diligently, you'll be amazed that you cross the millionaire mark with or without an university degree, with or without a certificate, with or without a regular job, and your financial immunity will be solid. Thank you, ladies and gentlemen. For your time in summing up i have run you through financial immunity 2.1 and our aim is financial wellness for all financial wellness for all and this is the 2.1 version where we've spoken about um the the the, the musings and we said that where the continent sits in terms of our income mobility if you are on the continent of africa you have to sit up because you are not in a good position against the odds. Then I spoke about the COVID-19 effect on our economies and even on our independent selves, either as working employees or as entrepreneurs. And I gave the example of pre-COVID and post-COVID and now, how bad the continent is looking and how it is going to impact on your own financial immunity. Then I asked about whether you are financially immune with the rule of thumb. Can you survive without any regular income for a minimum of six months without having to depend on anybody? If it is no, you are in trouble. If it is yes, do go ahead and keep doing it. There's a calculator we will give you in addition that will help you. Then I spoke about the financial services universe, understanding banking, understanding pension, understanding insurance, and then understanding investment. Then I talk about critically knowing the difference between savings and investment. And I showed with numbers what you can do if you do investment instead of saving. I also spoke about the 12 critical keys to building immunity. And then I showed you how to become a millionaire in any currency in the world with any amount you have in an investment instrument. Ladies and gentlemen, our mandate is to make sure that by 2030, eight out of every 10 young people in Africa are financially independent. I am inviting everyone of you to join this and make it work. If you do, you'll be amazed that 2030 by now, you'll be a financier to many of the projects on the continent. Thank you and have a great day. So we are now going to go into the Q&A. And now you can um, put on your video and let's engage. You can put on your video now and let's engage. So put on your video in a minute. You can ask all your questions. Good evening, Dr. Richmond. Okay, so let me pick the first question. Yes, uh, good evening, Dr. Richmond. I hope you're well. I'm Daniel. Hi. I have a particular question uh, regarding the economy of 
uh, a country in Southern Africa, looking at Angola, if we look very carefully at, uh, you spoke about uh, the inflation using investment to uh, negate inflation. If we look at the uh, economy of Angola, it's quite huge, but the currency is so down. Now, some people are doing well, but if I'm looking at the investment part, if I decide to invest in Kwanzaa, their currency is Kwanzaa, if I decide to invest in Kwanzaa, and at the end of the day, inflation has beaten and battered down the currency so much that it is so worthless, is it prudent to invest in other areas talking about properties because I didn't hear you talk about properties. You only talked about investment insurance, uh, banking. Will it be worth it to invest in uh, immovable assets as well, looking at the, how the inflation has battered down the currency, especially in that country? Right, right, right. So let me do, let me ask a question. What is the inflation rate in Angola? Uh, it's very high. So the last time I checked, it, it's Past a double digit is is around uh, 19 percent. And what is the treasury bill rate in Angola for 91 days? Oh, that, that I don't know so well. I have. So that is how it. you check if you are if you want to maximize um, leverage on the market. That is how you check. You check the inflation rate. You check the okay. the federal government's um, bill rate for 91 days. And almost all the time, almost all the time, you will notice that that rate is higher than um, um, inflation. Now. Properties can be another investment too, or even businesses and things like that. But remember always that that is a very capital intensive venture. You are a, a normal regular income earner. You don't earn much. Um, you can, you can, your salary can help you to buy a property. But if it can, just make sure you are buying the right property. Remember, it is a fixed asset. And so it is not liquid. You can't go and just sell it when you need it most but it pays very well over time. So then you weigh the risk against the return and you can also venture into anything like that, but you can be guided when you get into things like that. So that's another way you can invest. You can also invest in businesses, you can invest in cars or anything like that. But the list in this 2.1 um, course, we talk about the basics. We have another called financial uh, immunity um, 3.0. At 3.0, we go into a number of things, derivatives, property, business, and a number of things. But for at every level T, at every time T, if you want to invest without having to spend time on, without having mm -hmm. to always um, put money into, then financial investments are better than just going into a business investment. Thank you. Okay. You're welcome. Thank you very much, sir. All right. We are taking just five questions and we're out of here. Okay, any question, please? Hi, can you, you hear me? Unmute, yes, unmute and go ahead, yes. Oh, okay. I've got a question. You're saying, uh, I've, I've just checked your slide on the, the monthly um, savings amount that you should be able to, just, that just you a should second. save. Um, um, wh which country? Namibia. Maybe, okay, all right. Yeah, uh, in order to be a millionaire by the age of 60. But I see your, your interest rate is 15%. Right. Um, do you think that's a bit exaggerated? Like the uh, investment accounts are usually only 8% maximum? Or am I mistaken? Is there, what, 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 what would you recommend as the best investment account? Well, well, there are a number of things that pay higher. So for example, there are mutual funds in Namibia that pay higher. The Namibian Stock Exchange, we can do a simulation on the financial stocks. And for the last, for the last 10 years, there are stocks that have paid even more than 25%. So again, again, it serves as a guide. So if you go and they are, they are, they are, they are quoting anything below that, it's probably a regular account in a bank. Ask for an asset management house or a brokerage mm. company and ask for mutual funds Mm -hmm. Ask for very good listing stocks. Ask for um, bonds, even bonds. The governments of Africa are borrowing left, right, center. And most of the time they use bonds. 
and it is very expensive to 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 for them to borrow bonds. So you can make more than that, and they, this fifteen is the least across or more than twenty six countries. So it serves as a guide for you. Anything below fifteen percent will be a struggle. You can achieve that. So it serves as a guide as you go around shopping. You ask that. However, when you are checking for rates, also make sure you are not exposing yourself to crooks or Ponzi schemes. There are people that can even promise you 30%. There is a way to check if it's a Ponzi scheme. And maybe at our other classes and at the other meetings, I will show you how to check for a Ponzi scheme. You can visit um, our YouTube channel, which one Kwame from Pond on YouTube and look for identifying Ponzi schemes. And we'll show you how to identify a Ponzi scheme so that you match return against risk. You are very careful with return against risk. You don't just go for um, anything. But I can promise that, or I can assure that 8% would be just a regular savings account. Look for something better, not less than 15. Thank you. Thank you. Well understood, thank you. All right, all right, all right. Let me take, so we have three more questions to close. Hello. Hi. Hello, Doc. Good evening. Yes, sir. Uh, good evening. Um, thank you very much for such uh, an insight. Uh, this is Maxwell from Ghana. And I think you have thrown more light on how we can all become millionaires. And this is uh, some of the things that some of the youth we are really looking at because uh, most of us have lost it. We, we are thinking probably you have to work for maybe 30 years or 40 years in your life before you can make a million Ghana cities. But I think today we have learned a whole lot. But I, I'll be glad if uh, you can throw more light on how we can have a well-diversified portfolio. Uh, you know, we don't want to risk uh, investing the money with maybe uh, just uh, one financial institution, probably. Uh, how we can have a well-diversified portfolio. Thank you very much. That, that's a very good question. So, like I said, 3.0 will talk about a number of things you can do to diversify business, properties, and things. But for financial investments, it's important to diversify your income sources. Even if you want to buy a product. So for every investment product, there are three different cycles if you want to diversify well. There is short term, that takes care of emergency needs. There is medium term, that takes care of two to three years. And then there's long term. So when you want to invest, even with one institution or even a multiple institution, always make sure that your investment product there is one that matures in a year or less, between 91 days and a year. That one gives you liquidity. You can assess it all the time, and it pays higher than inflation. Then there's another that is between two to three years, maybe for the purpose of your child's school fee or for some other purpose. That one too, when you do that, it helps you. Um, I think, Maxwell, you can mute yourself now. When you do that, then you have split between short term and medium term. Then the last one will be long term for your child or for something that is 10 years and above. So anytime you are putting together a, a financial investment, you should have diversified yourself in the three different anchors of your life, short term, medium term, and long term. Because 20 years from now is long term for you. Three months from now is short term for you. Two years from now is medium term for you. So you look for products that serve that purpose. And for long term, if you advise very well, you can buy very good stocks in very good companies. Companies that are taking and making a lot of money and paying you nothing, like your banks. Companies like the guys who make your phones you are holding. So instead of owning, owning that phone, you own a share in that phone. Instead of owning a Facebook account, you own a share in Facebook. So you don't just come on Facebook to type what you ate today. As you are on Facebook, the gains you are making, you would have invested on the stock and you make some. So that becomes long term. So you diversify when you split between the durations, short term, medium term, long term. And then you diversify when you build other income sources. 
and then you diversify. When you even move outside of financial investment and put together business, put together properties, put together other movable things, put together trade. Remember, I talked about moving from A to C. So all these things make up your diversification and make sure you don't keep it all in just one company. You are good to go and you are safe when you do this. Thank you very much, sir, for the explanation. Two more and you are good to go. Doc, please, good evening. Good evening, sir. Yes, I would like to know <clears throat> if there are any Is insurance company that special. Yes, Ghana, I'm Richmond too. Okay. Please, I would like to know if there are any insurance company that specializes in only Okay, we are losing Asan, but I've seen his text. He's saying that in the chat box, he's saying, can you recommend life an insurance, insurance company? Without an uh... Okay, so I'm going to go to the chat box. He wants us to know an insurance company that has um, only life insurance without an inbuilt investment scheme. I will be advertising for them. So let's chat after here and I'll give you a guide. Thank you. Two more to go, I think. Two more, two more questions to go. There are a number of comments in the chat box from Uluwa Tosin um, in Nigeria, from Bupe Musuku in um, Zambia. Annette, are you asking a question, please? Maybe never. Okay. Okay, so I think that Next, next you're, you have to mute. Let me mute her. Okay. Okay. Okay, All Doc, right. I was trying to ask on text because my environment is quite noisy. Okay, so okay, uh, okay. every time I, I listen to uh, talks about money market investments, I always wonder to myself, whether how to what extent we we know Can what will happen. Sorry, are you are you are you are you are you in Ghana? Yes, I'm I'm in Ghana. I'm in Ghana. Okay, yes. right. So I always keep wondering to what extent we know what will happen in twenty years, in thirty years, especially in these days of volatile economies and all that. So uh, how uh, you partly answered my question with with the diversification, but I want you to maybe touch more on. Can I really say that I will still have that one million that I expect at 60? Will it still be worth one million? Will it be worth anything? What will happen with the introduction of such, such things as like cryptocurrency and all that? Are there any thoughts you have on that aspect? That's great. That's a good mind to have. So um, let me first say that nobody can predict um, risk. And it's not even just about investment. Everything you do in life, I mean, you can't predict the next 20 years whether you'll be around or not. We couldn't tell if COVID-19 was going to hit any of us um, in terms of countries, but it happened. However, it doesn't prevent you from projecting and planning. Now, listen to this scenario very carefully. The rate of interest on holding your money is zero. The rate of interest on not deciding to put your money into a financial instrument is zero. Anywhere across all the 46 countries that have joined us today in Africa, inflation is almost in the double digits. So if the rate of interest is zero and inflation is double digits, it means that your money plus zero minus the double digits in terms of value. So if you do not invest because you are anticipating that you can't predict what will happen in 20 years, you are rather shortchanging yourself because if you don't do anything about investing, the value of the money will go down. So that is the reason why you invest and you invest so that number one, the, the, the zero is beaten by the rate of interest on that investment. And it also safeguards you beyond the rate of inflation. 
However, because you cannot tell whether the businesses or the, the investment may run into problems, you don't invest and go and sleep. You keep your eye on the ground. You keep your eye on the investment. Just like if you bought a car for somebody to use it to work and every evening the person reports to you. You can't invest and not say you are not interested in the business news when you are listening to the news in the evening, but you are interested in the political discussions on radio. You can't say you have bought a share in a blue chip company on the stock market and you are not willing to listen to the stock market news at the end of the day because you think it may not bring you back and bed. You become financially literate and that becomes your business every day. You watch it, you monitor it, you get advice so that the moment you get a sense of any danger, you switch, you move, you sell off, you withdraw, you, 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 you discount and you move on. So that at any time T, you are off the guard of the dangers of investing. But it will be difficult extremely to predict. However, if you look at data for the last 20, the last 30 years, you will notice that the world's top 10 wealthiest people the world's top 10 wealthiest people oh, are not yeah. 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 Because of businesses. The world's top 10 wealthy people they are also worthy because they invested on the markets. They invested, they bought stocks and things like that. Let me give one example. Bill Gates wealth. You normally see that Bill Gates, um, Bill Gates is the richest man or you see uh, Amazon, um, Jeff Bezos is um, the, the richest. You see it coming all the time from, from um, um, Forbes. How do they calculate them? They calculate them by the value of their stocks by the day as they turn. Warren Buffett, who is about the third richest, one day said on an interview that his greatest regret in life is that he started investing too late. And they asked him, why are you saying that is your greatest regret? He said, well, I started at the age of... He said he started at the age of 14 and that is his greatest regret. And his explanation was that if he had started at age one, the 14 years would have taken him miles ahead. So you cannot become financial independent if you don't take this investment thing serious. And it doesn't have to be financial stocks. It can be business or it can be anything, but keep your eye on the ball. Be financially literate, be informed, so that at any time too, Thank you. Hello, 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 hello. Okay, so I think that our time is up. It is six thirty in Ghana. It is eight thirty in South Africa. Same in Namibia. Uganda is um, nine thirty. So. Ukraine is also 9.30. So I want to thank all of you. Unless there's a question, I see a number of questions in the chat box. Um, Christabel, okay, Christabel has a question, let me answer. Felix, at your bed, please mute yourself. Um, Christabel's question, let me see if I can find it. Christabel, 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 what is Christabel asking? Um, Okay, Christabel is asking, what are the safe investments we can make that will help us achieve 100K? 100K mark in, say, 10 years. Um, in Ghana, when you take a loan from the bank, the interest rate is about 22 and more. But I cannot think of any safe investment that can give you 22 or more of return. So, okay, two things. I spoke about leveraging on the banking system. If you can, if it is possible, Never build your financial immunity on loans or debt because the banking systems are such that it will be extremely difficult to become financially independent through their debt systems and the pricing of their loans. You'll be working for them at the end of the day. So just make sure all the time you start with what you have mobilized. Now, having said that, there are a number of investment instruments that can pay you the rate you are looking for. You just have to take the right mix of investments. If you go to the stock markets today and you pick the top 10 performance wow. stocks and you do a simulation of their performance over the last 10 years, even for just the Ghana Stock Exchange, they would have returned more than 22%. The 
there are mutual funds in Ghana, equity mutual funds, balanced mutual funds. If I check the last 10 years, they have done more in excess of 100%. And so, yes, you can actually take investment decisions either in mutual funds, in shares, in bonds, in commercial papers, in bankers' acceptances that can pay you this. You just need guidance. You just need to be guided. You just need to understand the market or um, you will be hot when you take those decisions. So, um, Christopher, yes, you can do that in 10 years if you are interested. You can do for, if you have missed the time, you can do for your children and promise yourself that by 18, your children should be millionaires. It's, it's possible. It's possible. It's possible. Thank you. All right, ladies and gentlemen, this is where we will be drawing the curtain on financial immunity 2.1. Financial immunity 2.1. And um, my assistant tells me that we had participation from let me let, let me mention the list. We had participation from from Ghana, Nigeria, South Africa, Uganda, Lesotho, Namibia, Zambia, Zimbabwe, Tanzania, Sierra Leone, Botswana, Cameroon, Kenya, Mauritius. Um, Cote d'Ivoire just entered. Somebody just entered from Abidjan. Kenya, Ethiopia, Seychelles, DRC. Um, this is on the continent of Africa. Then we have Egypt, Ukraine, US, and the UK. Thank you all very much for joining. I want to invite you to the YouTube channel, Richmond Kwame Frimpong. Go there, subscribe to the YouTube channel. There are a number of materials. Go to the website, flfafrica.org. There, there is a place called the Knowledge Hub. When you go to the Knowledge Hub, there, is deep, there are a lot of materials on banking, pension, insurance, investment. And our, pro, our project across the continent, Flicka or Flippa, Poverty alleviation, coronavirus alleviation. We we have launched currently. All the people that um, came from the countries are our country reps. We are driving financial literacy across the continent. Support and do a donation on GoFundMe, and you can support or PayPal. You can equally support if you are interested. If you want to pick a certificate for this course, if you want to take a certificate for this course too, that is equally allowed. We, I shared, um, I shared the certificate sample. You can click to burial on the zoo, on the on the chat page for all the people who registered and who arranged for you to get your certificate. Thank you, and um, God bless you for joining us. Facebook, thank you guys. Those who join us on Facebook and YouTube, we will end here and have a nice day. All country reps who are on, as we end, please stay. All country reps. Please stay. Um, I'll be having a, a, a quick announcement chat with you. Thank you. Those of us who are not country reps, you can log out now. Thank you and God bless you.